Good morning. Join with us, if you would, together as we sing, He's Coming, the Lion and the Lamb. Sing with me. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. As He comes this morning, let's open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. Turn around and greet one another as we continue this morning.
excited when the, the baptismal waters are, stir, are stirred, and we're especially excited this morning because we have, we have four of them, and, and all four are definitely a, a byproduct of just the ministry that First Baptist Church has, has delved into, especially the last few years, especially with, with free aid. So we're excited for that. All right, first up, we had Mr. Jared Sneathan. Jared came to Free Eighth last year, and he's been a, a big part of, of being consistently with us. He didn't get a chance to go to camp because of conflict, but hopefully next year. But Jared has made a profession of faith and has come forward uh, for believers' baptism. So Jared is by your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and your commitment to follow him that I get to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk a brand new life. Amen. Start coming down. Next, we have Miss Melissa Gill. Most of you, like I said last week, you know Miss Melissa and uh, very well, um, and your homes know her very well too. So we're we're excited that that Melissa has come. She's actually has already made a profession. She was baptized years years ago, but she wanted to make a recommitment, uh, especially with her two children being baptized this week. So we're excited for her, Melissa. It's your profession in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and your commitment to follow Him that I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, who bear with Christ in baptism. And raised to walk a brand new life. Amen. If you want to step over here, you can. Next, we have Brandy. It's like a race between which one's going to come out, I think. <laughs> Brandy had joined us last year with Free Eighth as well, and she got an opportunity to, to go to camp with us, and she also, as well, has made a profession of faith. So, Brandy, it's your profession in faith uh, in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and your commitment to follow Him that I baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk a brand new life. Come on down. Lastly, and certainly not least, is Aaron. Aaron is is the younger uh, sibling 
of Brandy, and he also has come to, to make a profession of faith and, and to be baptized. So Aaron is your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and your commitment to follow him, that I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk a brand new life. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today, God. Lord, I thank you for just the ordinance of baptism and the, the energy and enjoyment it, it brings as we get to celebrate it together, God. Thank you for each person and their profession of faith, Lord, and their commitment to follow you. Lord, as, as we continue in our service, help us to focus on, on you, Lord, and what you've done in each of our lives and what you're doing in each of our lives and what you're doing in the, in the, the life of our, our church. We're so grateful to be a part of it. Lord, help us to, to be with those that are not here with us today, Lord. Lord, just fill this place with your spirit. Lord, we just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Your breath in 
done for us. We want to sing in praise this morning. Ashley Beginness, there is an endless song. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storm of the morning. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting?
troubled times I can sing when I win I can sing when I lose my step And I fall down again I can sing cause you pick me up Sing cause you're there I can sing cause you hear me Lord When I call to you in prayer I can sing with my last breath Sing for I know That I'll sing with the angels And the saints around the Your soul to anger, your pain. 
life's strength is there, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. Would you stand and bless his name? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Father God, we honor you. We bless your name this morning for you are deserving of it in so many ways. Jesus, we thank you this morning for the death that you gave for us and the way that you showed us to live life. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you indwell us and change us and make us new day by day by day. We can never praise you enough for all that you've done. So take the praises that we've given, join them with the praises of millions and billions of angels. And may they give just a small portion of the honor that you're due. Take these gifts that we bring this morning. Use them for your kingdom's glory. And we will give you all honor and praise. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated.
Father, we declare our love for you this morning. We wait with expectant ears as to what your spirit will speak through your servant, Vince. Prepare our hearts this morning. May the words that we've sung not simply be uh, ramblings of words we see on the screen, but may they be the meditations of our heart. Open our minds to hear your voice. Open our hearts to be obedient. And then, Father, change our will and make it yours. We ask this in your precious and holy Son's name. Amen. Vince. And we're, we're continuing on this journey of, of looking what it looks like to minister in the ordinary. And we've got two weeks left of, of this idea of what it looks like to, to live the gospel out in our day-to-day -day life. And we looked at it like we get our... You're good. No, you're good. I got worried for a second. I thought Bill was getting brave and coming off the stage was <laughs> behind me. <laughs> We've been looking at this idea of, of with first week, we looked at how we get our fuel, our food, our energy by doing the will of God. And ultimately the will of God is for us to go and make disciples, to love him and love others. We, we see that in scripture and we see how that's what he wants from us. And, and then we look at this idea of, of be, with that, with us to do that, we have to be humble. We have to, for God to minister to us, and God to minister through us. There we have to have a sense of humility and along those lines, especially when we react in our faith. And, and, that, and that quote that we looked at this idea, the biggest test of our faith is not how we act, but how we react in life. And that's the greatest ministry uh, to others, especially and God using us and how we react to the gospel when we first respond to it, as well as how we react to others in ministry circumstances with the gospel. Uh, and then we continued on and we, uh, last week, uh, we looked at this idea of having a balanced meal. We have to prepare, we have to execute, and then we have to celebrate as well. If we get stuck in each one of those, like, there's, it's hard for us to do this idea of, of ministering in the ordinary. And, and with all that, the great news is this, is we don't do it alone. We don't do this, this life alone, and there's, there's two sides to that, obviously. There's two sides of, of we have each other. If you would look around the room, we have each other in the body of Christ. But also this idea as Baptists, it's hard to grasp sometimes. The Holy Spirit and how we have the Holy Spirit. And, then, and we're going to try to tackle a little bit of that today. And we're going to be looking at the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8. That just kind of is our ending point. It's actually our starting point as well. But we're, we're looking at Romans 8 as a whole. And you think about doing, uh, we don't work alone. And I know several people are wondering what kind of socks I have on today. Right? Well, in, in DC Justice League, they don't work alone. They have their powers, the Holy Spirit, and they have each other. So we're going to be looking at this idea, I have my Justice League uh, socks on today, and we're going to be looking at this idea if we do not work alone. Before we dive into the word, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, just to uh, thank you again for this opportunity to come and to, to be in your presence, Lord. Lord, to worship you, to worship with one another, Lord, and to feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. Or just help us to, as we dive into a, a tough topic of, of looking at the Holy Spirit and what that means, God, in our day-to-day -day life of being, being in, engulfed in it, being surrounded by the, your Spirit, God. Lord, help me to step out of the way and let your word reign true, God. Lord, we just love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So, I want to start off, like I said, we're starting in actually the very beginning and the end of Romans chapter 8. In the, the end, we see this idea, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. That is a very bold statement. But before we dive into that, we also have to think about at the beginning of this chapter, it says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I like to call that a theological sandwich. Because there's no condemnation and there's nothing that can separate us from God. There's a lot that happens in the middle of that. 
And and Paul tackles that in Romans chapter 8. Actually, if you look at uh, the first half of Romans chapters 1 through 8 in general, he tackles a lot of theological faith stuff. Then 9-11, he hits on this idea of righteousness. Then 12 on, he hits on the practicality of living that out. It's kind of how it's broken down. And Paul is deep now. Paul is very deep in his thinking because he he came from a very uh, deep background in, in being very educated, but also he had a very life transformating uh, happening in interaction with Jesus that has brought all this out. And sometimes Paul gets too deep for me, I feel like. If when you re- first read over stuff that he writes, it's like, what? You know, and I don't know if that's, I'm the only person that does that, but at times I read over and it's like, what is he saying? So today we're going to just kind of hit a, a, a framework, uh, a surface level, level, if you will, when he talks about the Holy Spirit. And I think, like I said, this is, a, this is a hard topic for us as Baptists sometimes in that we understand and acknowledge the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we don't fully understand and acknowledge the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Paul hits on this idea, like I said, a theological sandwich with, you know, we, nothing can separate us from love to also starting off why there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But we have to take a step back into chapter 7 before we can move forward. If you look at, at verse uh, 23 in, in, verse, in chapter 27, it says, But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In, in the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8, it's almost like a title fight introduction. You know, in one corner we have the flesh. And what all the flesh brings about, ultimately, it, it, Paul uh, says it brings about death. Then the other corner, we have the spirit. And what the spirit brings is, is life. And he's giving this big introduction into both of these and kind of going back and forth. But ultimately, he says, guess what? Spirit has already won. That's why there's nothing that can separate us. So that's why there's no condemnation. But even when we accept Jesus in our life, There's continually a war waging inside of us between flesh, what the flesh wants, and what the spirit wants. And we have to be aware of that war in order to fill out what the spirit wants for us. So he goes into, like I said, he says there is no condemnation. And then we're going to jump down. We're going to jump around a lot. He says there's no condemnation. There's a battle happening with inside us. Flesh, spirit. And we're going to jump down to verse 5 in chapter 8. Verse 5, and it says, those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Spirit, by, by the Holy Spirit, think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But, leading, um, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. When I was um, probably roughly KP's age, uh, I was, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years old, we lived in southern Indiana. We lived in, in the country. Uh, we had uh, three acres of land, and during that time, we had three grown German shepherds, all right? We had three grown German shepherds. My job each morning, KP gets upset when he has to feed our, our little tiny uh, miniature schnauzer. My job each morning was to feed the dogs, and, and we had two male German shepherds and a female. The female got to stay inside. The males went outside. So I, every morning I would feed them, and then I'd have to take the dogs outside. These dogs were crazy, need to say. They were just crazy dogs. My dad's first two German shepherds were well-trained. These were not well-trained dogs. So every morning I'd go out, I'd get, I'd put them on their leashes before we went outside. And I'd take them both at the same time because I just felt like I was good at like that. So I'd put them on their leash. I would take the leash and wrap it around my wrist because I didn't want to let go of the leash. And they would, in essence, I would take them outside. They'd pull me outside. All right. You've seen those people where they're trying to walk dogs, but the dogs are walking them. One morning, these dogs, I guess they saw a deer, uh, and they were known to bring a deer leg back. I don't know if they ever killed the deer, but they brought a deer leg back before. Decided they saw this deer, and what would they do? Natural instinct would take over, and what am I doing? I'm going for the ride of my life, being dominated by these dogs, dr- being drugged through the woods. I don't know how long I was gone. I was obviously gone for a while, 
Uh, when I got back, I was luckily not seriously injured. I was covered in mud, dirt, leaves. Mom's like, what are you doing? Why would you go outside and play before school? I was like, I wasn't. But this idea of, of domination, it says in, in verse 5, it says, those who are dominated by the flesh, it leads to death. Think about a dog. If you let a dog dominate you, that's no bueno, right? It's no good. I was dominated by those German shepherds. But if I had control, you know, if I was controlling them just as we allow the spirit to control us, a well-trained dog is controlled, they would never have done that. So the idea of domination leads to bad things and control from the spirit leads to good things. We understand that concept in a lot of parts of our life. And, and Paul is writing on this. He's saying domination leads to death. Control by the Holy Spirit leads to life. What's interesting in Romans chapter 8, Holy Spirit is mentioned more times than any other book or any other chapter. It's lifted 22 times in Romans chapter 8. So the Holy Spirit is, is important. The only other one I think is in Corinthians, it's listed 12 times in one of the, the chapters in 1 Corinthians. So the Holy Spirit, the idea of being controlled and almost other translations use led by the Spirit. If you're being led by the Spirit, if you're leading a dog, that's the, the good thing. But if you're being controlled or dominated by that dog, you end up in bad things. Bill understands some of that too, don't you? Okay. Control. Sorry, Bill. <clears throat> so the idea of, of being controlled or by the Spirit versus dominated is very important. Then we're going to jump down to verse 9. Verse 9, it says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. That's good. That's good news. We're not controlled by our sinful natures. You are controlled by the Spirit you have, you are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God. Everybody say, Spirit of God. Spirit. If you like to write in your Bible, circle that for you. Living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ, everybody say, Spirit of Christ. Living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, Everybody say it. Spirit gives you life. Say it. Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to you, your mortal bodies, by the same Spirit living within you. That is a lot of theology packed in just a short number of verses. And when I, when I read this passage, there's, there's three things that jump out to me. Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, and just Holy Spirit, Spirit in general. It's reflecting, I think Paul is reflecting on the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But he's showing it in the, in the form of spirit because he's wanting to relate that when you have the spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you have the spirit of God, the creating power, the life-saving power, the life-sustaining power with inside of you. I want to say that again. When, when you have the Holy Spirit, you have the spirit of God inside of you. That is the life-saving. He saved you. The life sustaining, he sustains you. And ultimately, the life creating, he has created life. You have that same power inside of you. But then he goes a little bit further and he says, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, now he's saying you have the same spirit that Christ himself had on this earth. And if you look at other letters of Paul, we see that same spirit listed as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self control. He's saying you have that same spirit, that you, that's how you should live. And we look at Christ's life and he exhumed every single one of those spirits at all times. I believe as Pastor Jackson said it this summer at his Bible study, whenever you see the fruits of the spirit, fruits, fruits is not flutes, fruits is plural. And all the spirit, because you're supposed to be exhibiting all those at once. Like that is the fruit of the spirit. Is all of, all of those, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, that is the spirit of Christ inside of us. And ultimately, that is the Holy Spirit that dwells and dwells in us. 
that is the counselor, that is the, the, the one that, is, that has come because of Christ. Christ said himself, I must leave so that God may send another, that we may send another to be a helper, a counselor for you. God, Spirit of God, Spirit Christ, and the Holy Spirit that indwells in us. Then jump down to verse 15. This is why it is so important. Uh, Paul gives a, a great picture of, of what it is to be, have the Spirit inside of us. So you have not, so you have not received a Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit. Everybody say God's Spirit. When you hit, were adopted, you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. I love the picture that Paul gives here because it's not just a matter of of having children. That's important. You know, having children is great. You know, we see that in in a lot of the Old Testament texts, Abraham and the offspring that he had. But Paul gives us this picture of adopting children. So much so that adoption comes with this idea of you were chosen. God chose us and that he has brought us into his family. And because of that, we are, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. When we were sitting in the courtroom and and, and officially adopting KP, we had already known we loved KP, but by signing our names and swearing in for the judge, we have said, this is our child. And there's nothing that can separate him from us. God is saying the same thing, so much so that you can call me Abba, Father, the most personal name that there is for me. Please, he's saying, you are heirs to my throne. You have given us. So when we receive the Spirit, that just signifies. That's why there's no condemnation. And that's why there's nothing that can separate us from Love of Christ. Then Paul goes a little bit further and he talks about the future glory and that that knowing that we're going to go through suffering. But there's hope because at the end of this line, at the end of this life, we're going to have eternal life. But then then he takes a step back and says, this is how the spirit can work for you in our day to day life. Verse 26. Let's jump over to that. He says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we do not know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all his heart knows what the Spirit is saying, for Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Again, this is a very wordy picture of what the Spirit does for us. So yesterday, we, it was pr- my, primarily me and, and my, my wife is, is, is lovely and she's great. And she's, she just realized I need to get out of San Angelo a little bit. Hadn't been out since camp. So I just need to get out of San Angelo for a, a little bit. So we decided to go hiking in the middle of the day over at Colorado Bend State Park to see the waterfall that was over there. Well, so we drive over there. We don't get over there till 2 o'clock, roughly. It was hot at 2 o'clock. Um, I don't know what we were thinking. But great, we had, we had doubts at times of, oh, is this the right thing to do? Both our boys had fevers this week. What are we doing right now? And at different times, but we pushed through. So this picture came to mind. We're walking. You know, when you're just sitting in the car, just sitting around, we don't recognize our breathing, do we, most of the time? We don't, we don't tell our heart to beat, you know. I shouldn't be going that fast standing here, but we don't tell our heart to beat at all. We don't have control over that for the most part. As soon as you start hiking or walking in some of those, those hills, and especially at, towards the end when we were coming back up the hill, you begin to recognize your breathing, right? You begin to realize, <gasps> you know? And then you realize, begin to recognize that heart's about to pound out of your chest as well. And that's, that's, I think, the idea of the spirit. We don't have any control over the spirit. But the spirit, the, as your lungs are working on your behalf and your heart is working on your behalf to make sure you get the amount of oxygen you need, the spirit groans for us when we need it most. When we don't even recognize that we need it most. That's when it's groaning and it works on our behalf. It's, it prays the prayers that we need in the midst of it all. 
When we don't even know what to do, we just say, God, help us. The Spirit is working. The Spirit is, is leading, pulling us in the directions we need to go. And it's just a matter of recognizing the idea, the choice of, of death, the choice of the flesh, or we're going to make the choice for life and follow what the Spirit's doing in our hearts. Well, then it goes a little bit further. In, in verse 28, it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Again, this is the spirit working inside. So not only does the spirit groan on our behalf when we don't realize we need it, but also there's times in our life, and this reminds me of, of, of sports, Especially college and, and high school, uh, college baseball, high school football. There were, in, our, in our region for football in high school, we played a weaker region. Like our teams that we played, they're really good at basketball. Football was not so good. So we'd play really hard three games up front. And then we'd play at our region, which was kind of weak. We'd beat teams like 80 to nothing. Um, so I would play the first half and one drive of the second half as a starter. You'd play, so that, well, I would even play a full game during the heat of our, our season. Well, in the midst of that, sometimes our coaches would recognize when we're not playing the way we should. So they would correct us. Even so, I, I reminded of, this is college baseball. We were, went to North Carolina, um, and you talk about you have a, a sweep party when you sweep people. You beat them all three games in a series. We were swept. We had a sweat party on the way back on the bus, which meant we didn't get to watch TV for eight hours. And we're quiet the whole time. That was hard. So we, we get beat by um, UNC Greenville. It's an eight-hour drive from, from there back to uh, or it's UNC Greensboro, actually, back to Statesboro. We don't talk the whole time. We know, like, this is ugly. This is bad. Mondays, the good news is Mondays are supposed to be our day off. So we're kind of like, okay, there's a day there that our coaches can just relax, and maybe they'll forget about it all. We get back to Statesboro about 2 o'clock in the morning, probably, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Coach stands up. We're like, oh, gosh, this could be interesting. We might be on this bus for a while because we've had moments like that of just getting chewed out on a bus. He, he doesn't. He doesn't chew us out. He says, guys, by NCAA rules, I can't have you back. I can't take you out on the field and correct some things. But you will be back up here at 6 o'clock this morning. <laughs> So, so we go, we're like, oh my gosh, like we, what are we going to do now? So, and I knew, we knew what was coming. So we all tried to go to sleep for a couple hours, uh, had to come back up to the baseball field. The lights were on and we do, we do something called a slaughterhouse. And all that is, is a fancy word for everything you can to make everyone get sick. Like sometimes you would, you have to nominate people like you make yourself throw up so we can be done. Like that's just part of you drew, drew the short stick. Like sometimes it just worked out that way. But I, I say that I call that story out because there's times in our life. It says in, in scripture there, it says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. There's times in our life that the Holy Spirit is like a coach. It understands that we're going down the wrong path. And then it begins to convict us and say, it's time to turn around. Just like a coach that recognizes, or good coaches, we're not going to comment about coaches this week, but good coaches, good coaches recognize when a team is going down the wrong path. And they correct them. They say, guys, we're, we're not working the way we should work. We need to get this. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's a slaughterhouse. I think sometimes in our life, the spirit moves us and convicts us in our life saying, time to change course, time to make the choice of life. And then as, as we get this idea of, of, so this idea of the Holy Spirit breathing, working through us and, and groaning for us, but also working for us as a coach. And then the end, the verse 38 says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels, demons, Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above on the earth, below, indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Spirit is working on our behalf. The Spirit is, is here and it's amongst us and it works for us. It groans for us. Sometimes it corrects us. But the Spirit is, is the creating power of God. 
The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, the love, the joy, the fruits of the Spirit. That is the Spirit working in us. Jesus says, I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to send a counselor. Now, for us in our day-to-day lives, it's just a matter of recognizing when the Spirit is working. Recognizing when it's leading us away from bad into good or leading us to make life choices, spirit choices versus what our flesh wants to do. We have that choice every day in every moment of, of recognizing where the Spirit works, and we can do that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today, God. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, to dive into your word, God. Lord, I thank you for the spirit, the helper, the counselor that you have given us, God. And, and there's times that it groans on our behalf, God, that it's working for us, even when we don't recognize it, Lord. There's other times that it, it corrects us, God, that it recognizes that we're going down the wrong path, Lord. And, and this idea of, of ministering in the ordinary, living out the gospel daily, we must rely on the spirit. To lead us, Lord, to make choices that are about life, not flesh, not death, Lord. Lord, I pray that anybody here amongst us that has not made the ultimate life choice to follow you, that you would, the Spirit would prod their heart, move their heart, God, to to make that choice today, Lord. And for the rest of us, God, we have a choice daily, Lord, to pick up our cross, to live by faith, to live by the Spirit working in us and recognizing where it's working in our own lives and the lives of those around us, God. Lord, we, you have not sent us to work alone. Lord, you have given us the Spirit of your creating power. You have given us the Spirit of your loving power through Christ. Ultimately, that resides as the Holy Spirit, our counselor and helper. Lord, we just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.